Taylor Riggs in San Francisco in for Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, strong debut. Shares of Alibaba begin trading in Hong Kong, ending the trading day more than 6% above the list price. Plus, check the book. Softbank startup bookkeeping draw scrutiny. Scrutiny will have details. And StubHub recipient, we hear from Viagogo founder and CEO Eric Baker after that $4 billion StubHub cash deal from eBay. But first, to our top story. Five years ago, Alibaba pulled off its biggest ever IPO on Wall Street, and today it rang up the biggest share sale in Hong Kong in 10 years. The listing is being seen as a triumph for a stock exchange that over the years lost many of China's brightest technology stars to U.S. rivals. And it comes as pro-democracy protests have gripped the city for weeks. Joining us from Washington to discuss it is John Freeman, Vice President of Equity Research at CFRA. John, as you take a look at the company raising an additional $11 billion, where do you see that company in terms of their use of cash? Oh, so thank you for having me. Yeah, so it'll be very interesting to see what they do with the, you know, with the extra cash, because I think that brings them to, uh, I want to say, $43 billion in total and uh, about 21 in net cash, you know, if you, if, you minus, if you subtract out the debt. Here's what I'd like to see them do. I would like to see them uh, invest heavily, more heavily into the cloud business, which is honestly, I think it's 8% of revenue now. It was growing 64% uh, year-over-year -year growth in the last quarter. Um, we know, we've seen this movie before, how this cloud business scales uh, with Amazon. It, with Amazon, it's 12% of revenue, but it's 70% of profit. So I think, you know, as it crosses the, you know, break-even point soon uh, and, you know, they can offer additional services, uh, I think that would be a good way to, uh, to spend the money. Um, and I'm sure that they're probably going to invest some of it uh, uh, along those lines, as well as um, artificial intelligence and cognitive computing. I think those are, are the things I'd like to see uh, uh, them, you know, focus Focus on with the with the use of cash. John, I want to take a look at a chart that I'm showing here inside my terminal for our audience, and it's showing basically Alibaba continuing to gain ahead of other big rivals in China that we know, like Tencent, for example, right. extending that lead, extending that outperformance. Uh, have they not done enough in the cloud computing and the other sectors that you mentioned? It seems, at least from the stock price, they're well ahead of rivals. They certainly are, um, but I, I think just like Amazon, when you know, once Amazon was valued uh, uh, previously, no one really saw the cloud business coming. I think with Alibaba, it's a little more anticipated. So perhaps the cloud, you know, for, to a large degree, uh, what is being reflected in the stock price now uh, reflects uh, some of the optimism uh, of that cloud business. But I really think that uh, people don't realize what kind of uh, earnings growth that can that can propel. In the past, revenue growth has been 50 percent. For, you know, above well above 40% over the last couple of years, but earnings growth has la actually lagged behind revenue growth. But I think with you know the cloud and a lot of these kinds of uh, primarily the cloud and, and sort of the uh, uh, scale efficiencies of the of the of their retail business that can reverse and is likely to reverse su such that earnings growth actually will probably you know uh, exceed revenue growth uh, in 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 the low 30s uh, for the next three years. That's that's pretty that's pretty compelling for a stock that's trading at you know 24 times earnings you know that you usually don't see that here in the states uh, uh, certainly for a tech company like that well and John you know you've mentioned Amazon a few times I think over the years as we've tried to define this company we would off the cuff say it's the Amazon of China for example I've heard maybe that that's not accurate as you take a look at this big company with tentacles in many different business lines how do you categorize Alibaba Oh, I think it absolutely is the Amazon of China. I, I think that's a, if you wanted a, you know, the revolving door pitch and just quick description of what this company is, that's how you would describe it. Um, and, and, and of course, there are differences. There are significant differences. But, you know, uh, uh, they're, they're certainly, you know, in, they are dominant in e-commerce in China, just like Amazon is dominant in e-commerce in the United States. They do direct sales as, as well as support a third-party uh, platform for third-party sellers. They have, like I said, a cloud 
child business. They are getting into the media and entertainment side uh, as, as, as an add-on. And Alibaba, of course, is also involved in more uh, in, in payments and, and, and that kind of uh, uh, area you know, relative to Amazon. But I do think the companies are similar. Um, and I think that uh, one of the, you know, the, the things that are propelling Am uh, uh, Alibaba to faster top line growth is the fact that e-commerce uh, you know, is, is a, a larger percentage of, of Chinese commerce, which is, of course, growing faster. You know, retail is obviously growing faster than it, here is, than it is here in the States. Um, and then cloud is at a lower you know, level uh, on an absolute basis. Therefore, it has a chance to really, you know, really shine. Uh, Amazon's cloud business is growing in the, you know, about 40 percent. Like I said, uh, uh, Alibaba's you know, 64 percent. So I think you know, that, that's what you want to focus on is, is those fundamentals. And you know, so that's, that's, that's how I view the company. Right. Yeah, John, I want to talk finally about one uh, headline in your research note that says patriotism does not go far in equity investing <laughs> as we switch right. from fundamentals to looking really at this Hong Kong listing. Did the company today, mm -hmm. given its Chinese base, it create some goodwill with Hong Kong by listing with Hong Kong? Absolutely, absolutely. So you know, I think, and, and I think, I think that's reflected in the fact that, okay, so this is not an IPO. I heard the word IPO kind of thrown around with this listing. Obviously, there's nothing initial about it. It's a secondary offering, um, but it's and normally with a secondary offering, offering which is dilutive, and it is to about a, a two, a little more than a two percent, you know, uh, a degree. Uh, the, the stock price kind of declines a little bit. In this case, it went up, and that's because mainland Chinese were able to purchase shares for the first time directly. And that's fine, and that's good. But I think you know, at the end of the day, earning you know, stock prices reflect earnings growth. So that's what I think, as a fundamental investor, you need to look at uh, in, in evaluating Alibaba. Well, fundamental and patriotic uh, analysis. That is John Freeman of CFRA. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Now, Dell is exploring a sale of its cybersecurity business in hopes of garnering at least $1 billion for RSA security. The company acquired RSA through the 2016 takeover of EMC, which went for about $2 billion. And on Tuesday, the computer maker reported third quarter earnings as well, with profits topping Wall Street estimates. For more, let's head to New York, where Bloomberg Deals reporter Leanna Baker has been covering the story. Leanna, we're getting the earnings uh, just crossing in the, in the last afternoon minutes or so uh, beating on the bottom line as the company releases corporate demand for computers walk me through your takeaway from earnings Dell's sales only grew about 1%, which was less than analysts thought uh, by a, a small margin. Uh, its earnings did beat analyst estimates, and it did say it would try to pay off about $1.1 billion in debt. And that really is the story with Dell. Dell has long-term debt of about $47 billion, so uh, the shares didn't really move after its earnings today, and they'll have a call later. You know, Leanne, I want to talk about that deal uh, of the cybersecurity space. Selling off a billion dollars, is this because they wanted a billion dollars to pay down some debt, or are they exiting a cybersecurity business that they don't want to be in? In conversations with sources, from what I understand, even if Dell gets over a billion dollars for RSA, the pioneering cybersecurity company that it bought through an EMC acquisition a few years ago, that won't move the needle for paying off debt. They still have 47 billion in long-term debt, but it will help the company become leaner. They are really more focused on PCs, storage, infrastructure, and cybersecurity isn't a huge focus for them anymore. It's been reported that Dell has also looked before at selling its stake in SecureWorks, which is a cybersecurity services provider. So a billion dollars, even if it does sell, won't be a huge uh, needle mover for them. But it's a big story because RSA is a big name. Well, and it's also a big story because the $1 billion price tag is notably less than what we said that ECM had paid for it uh, a, a decade ago or, or so. Is that indicative of the changing landscape around the cybersecurity businesses? RSA is a good business. It was founded in 1982 and it has very high margins and EMC, which Dell bought a few years ago, it had purchased the company back in 06 and that was a different time. The cloud was just getting off the ground. There's so many cybersecurity companies that focus on what RSA focuses on, which is connecting corporate employees to their networks. 
RSA does have a lot of you know sticky clients, a lot of people with these tokens in their pockets that generate random codes to let them on their corporate networks, but it's a different time. There's newer companies out there, Okta, Ping Identity, a lot that we talk a lot about. Leanna Baker from Bloomberg, thank you for joining us. And coming up, more tension between Google and its employees as the company fires four workers tied to protests. We have the story next. This is Bloomberg. More tension between management and Google and the company's activist workers. Google has fired four employees for what it said were violation of its data security policies. But some supporters of the fired workers say that organizing activities led to their dismissal. Some Google uh, <coughs> staff have been protesting the company's work with the military, amongst other reasons. So to discuss all of this, we are joined by RBC Capital Analyst Mark Mahaney and Bloomberg Technologies Alistair Barr. First, Alistair, what do we know about the firings? So the, the, the four employees, we, we know a, cu a couple of their names. We don't know the, the other two. Um, that they All four have been involved in either protesting some, some of the contracts that, that Google has with, for instance, the Customs and Border Protection Agency, uh, the US government. And, um, and they've also been protesting some of, some of the things that have happened in the past couple of years at Google, including how the company's handled um, sexual harassment by a couple of executives. So, so, so the, the the connection between all those four is basically that they've been they've been they've been either involved in or helping lead lead some of the internal protests. Mark, at what point do you look at this and fold this into your fundamental analysis, if at all? Uh, four layoffs and an employee base of 110,000 is um, that 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 qualifies as immaterial. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if it leads the company from a business perspective to not participate in areas that are potentially commercially attractive, like defense contracts, that could be an issue for Wall Street. So, uh, and there have been some there have been some internal dissension, and you would expect it. Look, where are we? We're in the Bay Area, which is a unusually woke community, uh, good and bad. Uh, but it's uh, you know you have a very actively involved. Some of their employees are very actively and politically uh, involved, and so this, I don't think this is terribly surprising. I think you'd find this at other companies, uh, but from a street perspective, only if it really leads to um, missing of commercial opportunities. Well, and Oli, this is a bigger issue where this isn't a one-off situation. Like Mark was saying, this is happening a lot at a lot of different tech companies. Where does this fit in terms of size and scope for all of the other protests and increasing distrust between staffers and management. I think Google has had a, a, a great history of, of, of where, where basically employees have been empowered to, to say a lot of things on, on internal message boards and, sh and share their thoughts. And a lot of the amazing stuff that Google's come up with over the years has bubbled up f from that. They, they kind of empower engineers and, uh, and they kind of harness that. So if some of that goes away, that's, 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 that's not so great. Um, but, but in general, I, th I think the company, as Mark said, if the company steps away from any other any other contracts, that could be bad. But I think this latest skirmish is actually an example of where the company is actually trying to get everyone back to work and focusing on kind of product and strategy stuff. Mark, I want to switch gears with you a little bit and also take a look at a story that we got today. We know that Google had bought Fitbit. We then learned uh, in the recent weeks that Facebook was the original anonymous bidder that wanted Fitbit as well. They've given up uh, and Google uh, assumingly will take over over Fitbit. Where do you see all of these big tech players now vying for the wearable space? Well, I think you just hit on it. Uh, they are vying for the wearable space. And so we had Google for Fitbit, two billion cold cash. We had uh, Facebook for Control Labs, roughly 500 million. Amazon has now rolled out two more kind of wearables products, uh, Amazon Echo Loop, Amazon Echo Frames. And so when you see three of the uh, major fang names uh, start investing in wearables, we as investors should start paying attention to this space. Not material in the next two to three years, mm. possibly very material in the next five to 10 years. 
Snapchat's another company that's also invested aggressively in the space. So there's something here. Uh, there's a way to, maybe this is, I don't know if this is the next compute platform like mobile phones, probably not. But if there's something here or else these companies wouldn't be investing in this space. Ollie, what is it then about wearables? I think partly it's it's this this idea of ambient computing, which is which is basically we had PCs and laptops and then, and then we had phones which you carry around and then something something that's wearable is even more connected with you and goes with you in even more places and then maybe in the future with things like the the, the speaker technology that they have you know that you, you can just you can just be able to say things and, and get information that way so I think that's one part of it and then the, the other part is is the data right Google especially is very interested in health technology and so if they have a lot of that data it can actually anonymously in, inform some of the work they're doing in, in that area. Well, and Mark, we've been talking about Google, we've been mentioning Facebook, you've also been covering Twitter a little bit, so I want to switch and look at just the campaign ads and the campaign ad policies of these companies. Google seems to have been coming in the middle with Facebook on one side, Twitter on the other. How do you view Google's political ad policy? I think it's still a work in progress. I think it's still a work in progress at all three of these companies. Twitter maybe made some bold, uh, direct statements about no longer allowing political advertising. And I know you and I talked about that before. I, that struck me as um, uh, as sort of an extreme position. Uh, but there seems to be increasing pressure on these companies to, if they're going to accept political advertising, they should probably increasingly aggressively fact check them. That probably would be a great solution for Facebook. Facebook said it's not going to fact check them. It probably should. Mm -hmm. But that's a uh, that's my own personal opinion. And uh, but it's and this by the way, the only reason it matters is we've got a major election coming this year, and there's actually a fair amount of uh, revenue associated with this. I, I think we think there's going to be about at least two billion spent online trying to influence people's political opinion, political opinions and how they vote. Uh, that's a good thing. And uh, but you know how it's spent. If it, if there's people want to see more transparency at the most. That's the basic thing that I think most voters want to see. Most citizens want to see out of these platforms. They should offer that. And uh, to me, it, the one that none of them are actually doing a great job of showing greater in, mm -hmm. uh, uh, transparency. But they should be able to do it. Well, Bloomberg's Alastair Barr, thank you for joining us. And lucky for us, Mark Mahaney of RBC will be. Staying Sticking around. And coming up, we'll get Mr. Mark Mahaney's top tech picks for 2020, what he sees as the stock most undervalued. That's next. This is Bloomberg. We are wrapping up third quarter earnings and the communication services sector posted some strong top line revenue growth year over year was the best really of all the S&P sectors. But the bottom line is telling us a different story. I was taking a look at earnings per share growth year over year. It's relatively muted. Still with us to break all of this down and looking forward to 2020. It is RBC analyst Mark Mahaney. And Mark, what happened in the third quarter in the middle of that income statement where profitability growth looked less than top line revenue growth. That was the case with a couple of the companies that mm -hmm. were getting deeper into investment mode. I think the one that's the top of that list would be Amazon. They negatively surprised on profits because they're doubling down on this one day investment into a faster delivery, making Prime one day available. So that's an expensive investment. I think there was also actually more interesting story at the other side of the profitability curve. We saw a couple of companies that brought forward their profitability uh, timelines, Uber and Lyft. Snapchat is just about to print its first uh, positive EBITDA quarter. And uh, Pinterest is also turning the corner on uh, profitability too. So I was actually more struck by the profitability positive inflection points than the negative one. So let's get into those. Yeah. You brought up Lyft and Uber, for example. Yeah. Are you fully confident that 2021 target is intact? Uh, no, uh, I, I think it's a probability that they'll get there. I do think they have the ability to get there by getting greater leverage against their insurance costs. That's like half of their cost of the goods sold. It's a big expense for that, those companies. I think they also have some pricing power. And then I just think these companies, as private companies, were run really, really inefficiently, really, really yeah. aggressively for growth. That meant that, that meant that there was a lot of wasteful spending. You bring them public, public investors step in and say, we need profits. And so these companies, the management teams are responding to that. And so I think there's a lot of room for them to take out excess costs without sacrificing growth. We've seen that the last two or three quarters. My guess is we'll see that the next two or three quarters and we'll become more confident in 2021 profitability. So then how much of a hit for Uber was the London news this week where they temporarily didn't get their license yeah. to operate in that city renewed? Taylor, that's a big issue. Uh, so. Um, 
TBD, I think, I, I want to be careful here, though. I don't think they've been kicked out of London. Mm -hmm. uh, this has happened to them before, where they have had their license threatened. I think what they're going to do is appeal the decision. We're going to have, they're going to be able to continue to operate for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. I assume they'll be able to work it out uh, with the London powers that be, the taxi commissions. There's no question that Uber and Lyft take on big taxi, and they've done it in multiple markets. Consumers, at the end of the day, have voted pretty strongly that they like ride-sharing services. I assume that consumers in London are going to speak up on this, too. So we, we don't know how this is going to play out, but it's not, it's not over yet. They haven't been kicked out yet. And my guess is that just this happened about a year ago, that they'll stay in the market. They'll just have to work on more concessions. In your recent note, wrapping up third quarter earnings, what really struck me is Facebook remains one of your big large cap top picks really as you take a look back at where this yeah. company has run with all the regulatory scrutiny why Facebook you're right it's one of the you know the Facebook Microsoft Google Amazon Apple Facebook is certainly in the, the crosshairs I'm not sure they've done anything that really that cuts across antitrust lines but um, they clearly have had some uh, issues around data privacy uh, 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 user data uh, protection and so yeah we're focused on that we're concerned about that that said I think that's more than priced in you can buy this stock at a discount to its growth rate it's rare you get that opportunity with a tech stock and I think the fundamentals are the strongest in the uh, large cap internet space in terms of revenue growth and free cash flow generation. Another big theme of the year arguably yeah. has been the streaming wars. It's You've the had yes. Disney Plus. Where do all of the streaming wars fit into your thesis? Well, uh, what's happened, there clearly is a, a, a major inflection point here. Netflix went out on a limb seven years ago and said, we think there could be a market for streaming. I guess everybody's finally agreed. And so you're going to have everybody um, step in. But the biggest competition uh, for Netflix is already launched. That's Disney. Disney. And look at Netflix's stock. The, the one that started bottoming and when it finally started trading up is the first day that Disney was out because that risk is now in the stock and so it's safer that you can get in the water. And I think right now this is a scale business. Whoever has the most subs can afford to spend the most on content. Netflix has the most global subs today and my guess is in three years it still will. And if that's true you can have a lot of upside in Netflix shares starting right here. And we only have about 30 seconds, okay. but come and take a look at a chart that I'm showing in my terminal because what you think is the biggest play on this big increase in streaming is Roku. They are crushing it. They're crushing the shorts. They're crushing everyone, but it's been volatile. Why Roku? Because it's uh, if you're going to be a streaming provider and you want to market or uh, advertise your service, well, why don't you market to all those people who are already using Roku devices? And then if people start their subscription services on Roku, there's going to be a revenue share that Roku uh, benefits from. So it's kind of there's two or three wins out of this for Roku. There's a few derivative plays, but Roku's one of the best. I could do this every day. Thank you. That was RBC Capital's Mark Mahaney. Thanks for joining. Thanks. And coming up, Alibaba's big day. We'll head to Hong Kong as we continue our look at the company's listing debut. That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology Global Link, where we join Bloomberg Daybreak Australia to bring you the latest in global tech news. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco with Sherry Ann in New York and Paul Allen in Sydney. Let's take a look at those top global tech stories of the day. Sherry. Taylor, thanks. A partners group holding is considering a sale of UK software provider Civica Group. The sale could fetch close to $2 billion for the Switzerland-based asset manager. Civica provides specialist software for governments, healthcare providers, schools and more. A SoftBank-backed startup has raised $80 million in new funding. The AI customer analytics company called Appier tries to predict user behavior to help their clients retain customers and advertisers. Appier has raised $162 million in funding to date from investors including Sequoia Capital and SoftBank. And Ant Financial is planning to raise $1 billion for a startup investment fund. The venture will target startups from Southeast Asia to India to help Ant strengthen its foothold in fast-growing mobile internet markets. The fund will focus on payments and online finance. Those are the top global tech stories we're watching. Paul. All right.
right. Uh, thanks very much, Sherry. Let's uh, turn our attention now to Asia's most valuable corporation, Alibaba. Now, the Chinese e-commerce giant pulled off the biggest share sale in Hong Kong in nearly a decade, raising $11 billion. Alibaba plans to use the funds to drive user engagement, improve operational efficiency and pay for continued innovation. Well, joining us now from Hong Kong with more details, we have uh, Bloomberg's own Sophie Kamarudin. So, Sophie, you were down there at the Hong Kong Exchange on uh, Tuesday. We saw Alibaba shares rising about 6.6%. Uh, how, how was the mood there? It, it appeared to be a very successful debut. Yeah, plenty of cheer as it was a milestone day not only for Alibaba but also Hong Kong which is now home to two of Asia's most valuable companies and the welcome mat was certainly rolled out. We had Alibaba CEO Daniel Jang and senior management being joined on stage by Hong Kong's finance secretary and a former chief executive along with a local Boris chief and I can't forget to mention that there were dancing mascots as well as the de gong was rung. So a lot of cheer there as Alibaba shares opened at 187 Hong Kong dollars above the 176 issue price and shares rose as much as 8% before closing at 187 spot 80. It was the most actively traded stock in Hong Kong, far outpacing rival Tencent, which had been bumped down then to second place as Hong Kong's most valuable firm by market cap. And we do have ADRs in New York continuing to climb now above 194, rising for a fourth straight day then and so reclaiming that narrow premium to the Hong Kong listed shares, which could entice traders looking for arbitrage opportunities. Now the stocks are fully exchangeable with a 1 to 8 ratio, guys, and analysts are bullish. There are 58 buy calls to one hold on those ADRs, which have an average price target of 225. Sophie, what are you hearing about use of cash? They're raising $11 billion. We spoke with an analyst at the top uh, of our hour, and they're saying they now have $44 billion of cash on the balance sheet. Where are they spending? This was very much considered a symbolic share sale. Alibaba didn't necessarily need to raise this cash, and the total funds raised could even be boosted to $12.9 billion if a green shoe option is exercised. And when it comes to what it may do with its cash in this new era being held by CEO Daniel Jang, we could see more acquisitions. Perhaps funds could also be piled into a fending off competition on the mainland as it has rivals like Tencent, Meituan Dianping, Baidu, and others to contend with. Uh, we have our Bloomberg columnist Tim Culpin also pining perhaps we could see some buybacks or perhaps it may just sit on this growing cash pile. Yeah, in terms of the uh, buyback idea, Sophie, is there a sense that Alibaba might want to, uh, well, move closer to home and perhaps uh, uh, repatriate some of the money that's in New York? Well, this was part of the reasons that have been offered as to why Alibaba chose Hong Kong after failing to list here back in 2014, given uh, the strict rules around dual class share structures. And there are plenty of investors on the mainland who are just chomping at the bit to get in. If we just pull up the board here, when you take a look at the valuations for Alibaba, uh, there certainly is room to narrow that gap that we're seeing with players like Amazon as well as with Tencent, uh, given uh, that mainland fund managers say that Alibaba is a must have, but they're going to have to wait until the company is included into Hong Kong's trading links with China. The Stock Connect perhaps could be uh, initiated uh, by next year, and that's expected to boost valuations for Alibaba. Sophie, it's a very crowded market. As you've mentioned, Amazon, there's a lot of local Chinese players as well sort of nipping at their heels. What is Alibaba's strategy when it comes to how they're differentiating themselves? We have seen their ecosystem expand over the course of the years, getting into uh, various segments. They're also looking to move into uh, segments like logistics. So we have seen this strategy of saying they're going to try and hit the consumer across various touch points. Uh, you've seen that with uh, how Alipay has operated and Financial as well. That company uh, looking to start a uh, fund of $1 billion to move into the startup space. So it looks like Daniel Jang is trying to build on the foundation that Jack Ma has established. We also have Alibaba looking to move beyond Asia when it comes to its ambitions. Uh, so where they go from here with that cash pile, with that war chest, uh, it's certainly uh, lots that could be done uh, along the horizon. Uh, Sophie, this was obviously a very important day as well for the Hong Kong Exchange and Hong Kong more broadly, especially in the context of all the unrest recently. Is this going to boost liquidity in the Hong Kong Exchange and maybe encourage a few other listings? 
Well, that's the expectation. Hong Kong Exchange Chief uh, Charles Lee, he was certainly very cheerful uh, yesterday uh, following the debut of Alibaba. He said he was very much confident that other companies will look to Hong Kong when it comes to their listings, uh, given the relaxation around the dual-class share structure, for example, and uh, with China also calling for companies to return home. Now, Hong Kong has missed out in some mega listings in the tech space as Chinese companies have had to turn uh, to New York, for example, instead of closer to home. But tech unicorns like ByteDance, uh, they may now uh, consider this uh, journey as Alibaba has paved the way, if you will. And I also want to highlight there is a consultation underway for Alibaba to perhaps join the Hang Seng Index. Currently, it's unable to do so uh, because of the secondary listing as well as its governance structure. So it looks like uh, with the ambitions that Hong Kong has, which the exchange has, uh, there will be more reviews of how to entice these tech unicorns to come back to Hong Kong. And as for the city itself, you had uh, Carrie Lam um, also uh, being among uh, the campaign leaders, if you will, to bring Alibaba to the city, uh, which is a signal of confidence given the political and economic ructions that we've endured over these past few months. Thank you to Bloomberg's Sophie Cameroudin. And stick with us, we have much more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Just one day after Uber's future in London was cast into doubt, rival Ola said it had started signing up drivers in London and will start service in the city within weeks. Ola had expected to begin its London business before the end of the year. The company is now looking at a January launch. The Indian ride-hailing company, backed by SoftBank, said it already served millions of customers in other UK cities since its rollout last year. To discuss the ramped-up competition and implications for Uber, we're joined by Gabe Klein, partner at Cityfy. Also with us, Egal Arunian of Wedbush. Thank you both for joining me. Gabe, let me start with you. Sure. I think I'm confused about what the actual issue here. I know it's safety. I think city officials have increasingly become hostile to ride sharing companies. They're blaming ride sharing companies for traffic congestion. What's the actual issue in your opinion? Well, I think there have been a number of issues over the years uh, uh, with Transport for London, and the most serious, uh, you know, recently is the impersonation of drivers by, I think, about 15,000 uh, people. So they don't have security in place to verify uh, that a driver is who they say they are. They were asked by TFL in London to use um, uh, facial recognition technology. Uh, they did not implement it, uh, I think, in the time frame that they were supposed to. And at this point, they have once again uh, had their license suspended. Now, of course, they are going to appeal that. Um, and then I'm, I imagine it'll go through the court. So the real question is, how soon will this actually take effect on the streets? Egal, I want to pose that same question to you about how long it'll take to actually impact the company's fundamentals. Well, that all depends on what happens in the courts. So I think in the near term, they should be kind of operating businesses as, as usual um, yeah, as they go through their, through their appeal process. Uh, if they actually lose a license, then you'll start to actually see a real impact to, to revenue. You know, we estimate kind of three, four, maybe five percent of total revenue. So it could be a real meaningful impact. I think the, the larger question and the more maybe long-term question, because we would expect this to be resolved at some point, uh, would be what happens with competitors as they kind of come in uh, and try to take some share and you know leverage off of this opportunity. And Gabe, where do you see that competitive landscape? Well, look, at the end of the day, I mean, Uber's built an incredible product, a great marketplace. However, um, it's really a commodity at this point. And you see here in the U.S., you know, most of the drivers who drive for Uber drive for Lyft. Uh, overseas, it might be Ola or Grab. Uh, but for the consumer, they want to ride. And I don't think they necessarily care who provides it. And the big issue, I think, for Uber is that they have been on the outs with municipal governments uh, here in the U.S., in Europe. Um, increasingly over the last few years. We thought it would change with the new CEO, and instead they've sort of doubled down on these disruptive uh, tactics with local government. And I think we're seeing it play out, and we're seeing a real uh, pivot here in how government is going to deal with Uber and companies like them. 
Eagle, I want to show you a chart that I'm showing inside my terminal here at GTV Go, basically showing the stock price is uh, trading around $30 a share, but most analysts on the street are bullish. They have about a 44 price target or so, uh, which would be a gain from the current price. How much of London, of the regulatory hostilities that we see, are really starting to impact your views on the stock? Well, it's, they're certainly not making it easier. Uh, it's definitely been impacting the stock price. You know, it's not just London, it's happening in California. You know, you could expect to see other cities taking a look at this. Like, this could be a really serious security threat. Um, you know, it was drivers impersonating other drivers, drivers that were uh, driving without uh, licenses to, to do so. So it, it could be a real risk. I, I would think other cities start taking a look at this too. Um, you know, the question is, when does the regulatory environment kind of ease up around Uber? And I think it's on uh, it's on Dara and it's on Uber to to start to address those issues uh, more seriously, address these security threats, and you know start to put them to bed and put them behind them. It's been happening way too often for Uber uh, in the first kind of you know six to nine months as as a public company. Uh, they they need to be better at addressing that. Now, ultimately, we think they will be back in London. They, they they will be a meaningful player there. It's a really big market, and you know they could kind of navigate these waters and end up in a better position. Um, you know that's that's going to be a big test for them going forward. Is regulatory issues the biggest headwind for the stock, Egal? It's one of them. I'd say, me? I'd say competition and regulatory issues are are, are the two big challenges. Uh, competition is driving down uh, pricing and is really one of the biggest issues in terms of profitability and that's a big factor over the long term um, the regulatory things keep popping up and the bigger they become the more there'll be a weight on uh, on the shares of the stock. So we all talk to me more about competition. Who is the biggest threat for Uber at this point? Is it Lyft? Well, Lyft's the biggest threat in the U.S., certainly. Uh, the, the issue is they have different competitors in different markets, and some are more competitive than, than others. In the U.S., you're starting to see uh, rationalization come in. There's really only two key players. Um, I think that's when a market starts to stabilize a little bit better. The environment in the U.S. is certainly better. Um, you have DD coming in, in into Latin America, and they've had a big impact on their business there. Uh, I think in Europe, there are a, a number of competitors. You know, we're talking about Ola coming into that market. There's been talks of Didi coming into that market. Um, you know, it depends where they are, but the competition outside the U.S. is still a big issue. Inside the U.S., it's start to stabilize a little bit better. Gabe, we've been talking a yeah. lot about competition here. I want to get your thoughts on on competition. Where is the biggest competitive risk for Uber? Well, you know, I, I think um, as a counterpoint, uh, you know, I think this is a much more serious situation. Um, than we think because on top of what's happening in London, you have AB5 in California. It's not necessarily a competitor, uh, but the reality is if people are made employees instead of contractors, it's going to drastically change the economics of the business. And the fact is, you know, they lost, Uber lost $3 billion last year, more this year, with a sort of laissez-faire regulatory system. So I think as the regulations get tighter, as you see like bills like the Seattle bill that passed today, uh, which is calling for a minimum wage uh, uh, for and, and an added tax uh, for rides, you know, I think this is going to get more serious and then I think the competitor is ultimately the personally owned automobile. Oh that's interesting. Uh, walk me through that thesis a little bit more. Yeah, sure. Well, look, ultimately, I think Uber is going to have to raise their prices significantly. Um, they're losing, you know, 30 percent on each ride now. They're subsidizing that. Um, you have on top of it these new taxes being levied, uh, uh, different bills being passed that are increasing their costs. So if costs go up, then you have to ask yourself, you know, what is the growth rate that's already slowing uh, going to look like? And are people going to go back to driving personally owned automobiles? Now, as somebody that works with cities, we don't want to see that. Um, at the same time, we really want good actors to be working with city governments. And so, you know, it's really, I think, up to Uber uh, to take a different tact, a different appro uh, approach, and start to co create solutions uh, with cities instead of fighting cities. That's not going to pay dividends uh, for them uh, or for um, uh, stockholders of Uber.
Egal, it's interesting when we talk about the differences and similarities between Uber and Lyft, Uber in some ways looked like the smart ones doing a lot of different diversification of their business lines where Lyft is clearly the pure play North American player. Any sense from this week that maybe Lyft had the right strategy or Uber has the right strategy? What's your opinion? Well, you know, our view has been shifting on that actually, um, not just from, from this week, but over the past couple of months. Um, you know, on, on, on one hand, Uber's global ambitions and multiple business lines, ability to kind of leverage their platform across ride share and food delivery, uh, and then, you know, Adam Freight, which is a small but quickly gr growing part of their business. Uh, that creates a big opportunity for them over, over the long, long run. It's, you know, a, a really big market. And you know, if you can kind of see the, the, the fundamentals in those markets on a global basis start to kind of come together, uh, you could see where there's a lot of profit potential for Uber in the long run. But in the near term, Lyft's strategy is a lot cleaner. They're, the food delivery uh, food delivery industry is certainly under a lot more competitive pressures. The economics of that business are on, on, under a significant like question on whether you know that they they could last and uh, you know what what the opportunity there is over the long term mm -hmm. uh, in international markets and rideshare there's more more than two competitors so that's pressuring uh, their rideshare and in international in, in international um, as well and so there's I think it's going to take Uber longer to get to that kind of clean mm -hmm. point uh, Lyft seems to be there a little bit better right now. Gabe Klein of CityFi and Egal Arunian at Wedbush, thank you both for joining us. Thanks. And still ahead after the WeWork debacle, SoftBank, it is not only losing investors' trust in its startup valuations, its paper profits have also raised some questions. We'll have the story. This is Bloomberg. After the WeWork fiasco, SoftBank's startup investment model has been under fire as investors balked at big losses and troublesome governance. Now, the company's accounting also draws scrutiny as SoftBank provides little transparency of the profit gains on its income statement. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg Technologies' Pavel Opelyev in Tokyo. Thank you, Pavel, for joining us. Walk me through a little bit of this story, the difference between paper gains really questioning SoftBank model you know we, we've had about two uh, some years of vision fund seeing it in action um, and uh, while there's been sort of a, always a sneaking suspicion that a hundred billion dollar fund uh, 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 you know a proverbial 800 pound gorilla is going to do something to devaluations uh, you know it's it's not until the we work uh, fiasco that we actually start to see the results so so we decided to take a more systematic approach go through the uh, individual rounds and see how softbank participation has contributed to the inflation of the valuations but that's only part of the story as you said yourself the second part of it is how uh, softbank books these gains on their on their balance sheet and in the past two years the vision fund has emerged as the as the biggest earner for for softbank uh, far outpacing sprint and domestic telecom operations it's became a centerpiece um, of the company's uh, quarterly earnings while at the same time built entirely on paper gains and do we think companies like we work even though they're so hope high profile are one-off situations or is this a little bit more indicative of what's been going on at SoftBank well, that, that's really a, a, a multi-billion dollar question. Um, for once, we know that the companies, uh, the, the Vision Fund's right-hailing companies have been already redu reduced in valuation, and that's a direct impact from, um, from the decline in Uber shares. Uh, last time I checked, they were down 35% from, from their IPO offering. The problem is uh, we, we're told off record that, that DD, Grab, and Ola the entire right-hailing right portfolio has been reduced in value on, on vision fund balance sheets, but we don't know by how much. And, and, and there's no way to tell because one, uh, vision fund cannot disclose these numbers. Um, and, and two, the process of marking them up or down is, can be quite subjective. So should IFRS or GAAP accounting rules be changed so they are less subjective? 
you know, I, we, we, <laughs> we don't go as far as uh, issue uh, IFRS <laughs> recommendations in that story, but, but you do come away with an impression that while the IFRS standards are exacting and Vision Fund has plenty of checks and lots of professionals working to, you know, cross the T's and dot the I's, the fact is it, this is a time where s with so much liquidity sloshing around and with a $100 billion fund to disburse in just two years, um, the temptation is to play, uh, you know, fast and loose. It's, it must be very strong. Well, Bloomberg's Pavel Apeyev, thank you for joining us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.